Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 10 Things I Wish I Knew Before GP Training webinar. I hope you guys are well. Thank you to everybody who started to say hello to me. Welcome to everybody who's on board. Let me just make sure my cam is on. Give me one second. How are you doing, guys? How was your day? What you been up to? So I can see our stuff in the background. Hope you guys are doing super well. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Gyan. Hi, Serena. Hi, Preeti. How are you guys doing this evening? Thank you so much for coming on board. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us for this webinar. I hope it's going to be of some value to you. It's going to get a little bit of distance between me and the cam. Okay, we have around 350 roughly signed up today, so hopefully we'll get a good number on. There's already uh, over 100 on board, so welcome to all of you. Thank you so much once again for giving up your time. I know you're busy people. You're doing lots of uh, important things. I'm really glad and really uh, happy that you found the time out to join this webinar. Hi, Shireen. Hi, AS. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Syed. Hi, Muskan. Welcome to all of you guys on board. Thank you so much once again for giving time. I'm going to give people a few minutes to get on because there's quite a few people on the website right now uh, probably signing up and registering. So I'm just going to give people a couple of minutes. Hi, Mohammed. How are you doing? It's a challenging time and I remember waiting for my own GP training to start around this time I started to think about what is it all going to be like and what do I need to do and how, to, how should I prepare and I started to freak out a little bit to be honest and we'll talk about how you guys are feeling in a second so if you know anybody please do um, send that link along and I hope we can get them on board as well okay right so can you please give me a yes if you've just seen the slide change just give me a yes just so I know that you're seeing Things okay on your side? Just change the slide now. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Lots of yeses coming in. And just give me, uh, put a number three in the comment if you can see the webcam okay, if the webcam is working okay, so you can see me as well. Just put a number three in the comment. Good. Lots of threes coming in. Fantastic. Excellent. I can't see the chat yet, guys. We always keep the chat uh, hidden because there's so many of you guys on board and it gets very, very busy. So we keep it hidden, but I can see every single comment that you're putting through. So hi, Shireen. Hi, Aksa. Um, hi, Shamanisa. Good to see you. Hi, Afsal. Hi, uh, Rita. Hi, Afsal. From Manila. Adwoga. Noha. Brilliant. Really, really good to see some guys. And always, I recognize some of you guys from um, Hey Sunita. Hi, Kika. I recognize some of you guys from social media, and I recognize uh, some new names as well. So welcome to everybody who's on board. Hi, Mustafa. Okay, right. So let's kick into it. Um, before we get into the real thing, let's get a bit of groundwork done. So where are you guys based? I know you guys are going to be spread all over the UK, maybe worldwide, maybe worldwide. So let me know where you guys are. Let's see geographically, where are you spread? Is anybody near me? I'm based in Solihull in the West Midlands, near Birmingham. Where are you guys based? So we've got Preston, Manchester, Coventry, London, London, Birmingham. Great. Solihull, yes, fantastic. That's around the corner. Huddersfield, Leeds. Uh, Edinburgh, Dundee, Glasgow, Dundee and Glasgow, so I wonder if you're commuting between the two. Syria, fantastic first, international cultures of Dubai, excellent, Abu Dhabi, Karachi, Bolton, Walsall, Egypt, uh, London, London again, Cambridge, uh, fantastic, amazing, Kent, Manchester, Leeds again, Sheffield, great, amazing, amazing to see the, the huge spread of you guys. Uh, I love doing these webinars because we get to connect with so many people from all over the world, not just UK-wise, so um, it's great that some of you guys are tuning in from wherever you are and whichever time zone you're in, but most of you obviously in the UK because you are probably starting GP training pretty soon. Fantastic. Okay, Leicester, currently London moving, would you be training? Great, Swansea, great. Thank you so much. Um, some of you guys are saying, where do I type? Exactly where you just typed that message, that's where you type. I can see everything coming through. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for those who have just shared the link. I can see a whole bunch of people who've just joined up. So I guess some of you have shared that link on, which is great. So once again, if you do know anybody who may be finding this of some value, please do share that link and let's get them on board as well. Right, let's get the first poll going. Let's just see then how many of you are on from various stages in your career. So please do click something that's come up on screen, whether you're on your mobile, on your yeah, as expected, really, so 80% of you, 8 out of 10, are starting GBST1 in August, so basically next month. So I hope you guys are feeling good. We'll find out how you're feeling in a second. We've got a close to 10% who are applying for GP at some stage, so maybe you guys are doing MSRA maybe in September, I presume. So hopefully preparation is going well for that. We should see you hopefully on our MSRA webinar in a couple of weeks' time. Um, a couple of you guys are current GP trainees, so I presume most of you are GPST1s. Let me know if you're anything other than that. And then we've got 10% who are others. So you might be educators, you might be um, in a different field of medicine, but welcome to you as well. And I hope you find this of some value. Maybe 
you're about to be an ST1 in a different training scheme, different type of training area, I should say. Okay, uh, fantastic, that's great. And let's just see how many of you guys are joining us for the first time. Just again, one more click from you guys. It's the last click I want to ask for you guys. Is it your first ever Aurora webinar or are you somebody who's come back? Wow, 50-50, 50-50. This is the webinar where we always get a fairly equal split. Once we do our AKT webinars and MSRA webinars, we tend to get many more people who have been to us before, but for our first GP training webinar, 50% uh, of you are brand new to us. So let me know, guys. Uh, firstly, thank you to everybody who is brand new to us. I hope this is not the last time we get to um, share our evening today. We do loads of different webinars for parts of GP training, so there's quite a few coming up. I'll tell you about them later. And welcome to those of you who come back. Really glad that you've come back. Maybe you've been with us in the past from Plow webinars or MSRA webinars, but welcome back um, if it is your first one. Okay, so we're up to nearly 170 on join now. So welcome to everybody if you just joined. And um, we're just about to get going. I was going to give you guys a few minutes just to get on board. I know a lot of you guys, like you just mentioned, that is your very first webinar with us. Um, so maybe your first webinar on this platform. Okay, so for the 80% of you, for the 8 out of 10 of you who are starting GP trading in August, so in a month, how are you feeling, guys? Give me one word. Give me one word about where your mind is right now. How are you feeling? I'm not going to um, give you any name. Let's get see what you guys come up with. Um, how do you feel? Nervous, anxious, excited, um, overwhelmed, excited and nervous, anxious and nervous. Good. What else have we got, guys? Uncertain. Yeah, I remember feeling exactly like that about a month before my own GPST1. Uh, worried and anxious, worried, worried, anxious, excited, excited. Good. So there's a mix. I'd say about 70, 80 percent of you are saying the same kind of things. Lost, excited, anxious, terrified is a new one. Um, yeah, great. Hi, I said, I said, how you doing? I remember meeting for a plab. Um, Ashita, how are you? Uh, yeah, so all the usual words that I see in GPST1, like I felt half of these myself, and it was one of those things that one day I felt great, and one day I felt worried, next day I felt excited, uh, confused is coming up, scared. Yeah, so all the usual stuff. So the reason we do this is so that you realize that you're not alone, okay? Because it is a worrying time. You're about to start a, a training program that's basically going to lead the rest of your career unless you have a major change in the middle. So it is a big deal. And, you know, when you start your training program, it's different to F1, different to F2. Like this is your chosen career path. So it is a big deal. So I can see how you're feeling. And some of you may not, maybe have having second doubts about GP, all that kind of stuff is probably happening at this point. But um, yeah, all of you saying the same thing. So 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 hopefully you can take that in your uh uh, take If you're feeling worried, then just hopefully get a bit reassured so you're not the only one in that particular sphere. Right, so for those of you guys who don't know us and our first time to us, thank you so much once again for giving us your time. I'm Dr. Amin Arora. I'm Portfolio GP, full-time in med ed right now. Lucky to be a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. I've had loads and loads of roles in medical education. My passions are twofold. Number one, to help you get through your exams, and hopefully we've helped some of you guys get through some of your exams up to this point already. But secondly, helping you guys to maximize your potential because you guys have got so much potential in medicine and often it's lost and GP training as we're going to talk about later there's so many things that you can do to maximize your potential that's one of my passions so hopefully we'll get to to guide you through some of those steps as you go through but loads of different educational roles many within GP training so I used to be a GP training PD so some of you guys will talk about PDs and what they are in a second I used to do that so I know a lot of trainees from that point of view I used to appraise GPs I used to be involved in the recruitment process so the stuff that you guys have just done really getting into GP training used to be heavily involved in that so a lot of different roles within GP training whereas now I'm fully into Royal Medical Education you guys know we run training courses and um, resources for multiple different exams including getting into GP training but also the bulk of our stuff is for GP trainees and MRC GPs so hopefully we'll be seeing some of you guys in the future and Pooja um, some of you guys all know Pooja my wife she is joining us somewhere on this webinar she'll be putting some posts and links up in the chat um, she also um, has a side role, so she's a GP, but her main passions were medical politics, uh, and that was her side hustle. A lot of people in GP do have these side issues we'll talk about in a second, um, and she also now helps a lot in Aurora Med Ed, and some of you guys may know her from her posts and her blogs um, to do with GP training. So welcome to her, Pooja. I think you're on board. Um, just pop something in the chat if you are, just to know that you're on board. By the way, she's putting, um, we have two little kids and I just about got down in time from putting down, putting my six-year-old to sleep, just about got down in time. Um, Pooja, last time I saw her, I was about to start, she was putting our two-year-old to sleep, so she may still be in there, I don't know, but hopefully she'll join us at some point. Okay, right, so 
let's get going with webinar. So, so these are things we're going to try and cover in the next what hour or so and try and jam a lot of 10 things that I wish I knew before starting GPST one things that people didn't talk about people things that mention um, and I'm going to talk about those so that you are prepared for them when you start your first day what does I think about right now with a month to go what not to worry about also with a month to go because a lot of stresses build up before training how to shape your own training how you can get your st1 up to the perfect start how do you look after yourself because there's lots to come in gpst1 and it can get quite overwhelming and then our usual webinar only offers we always offer um, webinar specific offers for you guys who are on webinars and these are the two things that are coming up i'll be giving coupons in the middle of the webinar our new gp20 gold pass package which is a three product combo discounted bundle normally 207 is down to 125 today and our triple flashcard deck as well, which is perfect for GPST1, our guideline uh, flashcards, our pharmacology flashcards, and our medical explanation flashcards as well. They're on offer later on as well, but I'll come on to those coupons in a short while. So first, congratulations, guys. Um, getting into GP training is no little thing, right? Yes, it's one step on many steps in your career, but well done because it's a huge achievement and you can start to see the end now. You can start to see where you're going to shape your career. And very soon, I know it seems far away, but very soon, you're going to have to start making some pretty big choices. And this is where it starts to get quite exciting. You get to choose how you work your career. You get to choose so many things that you haven't had a choice for so far. So far, you've done what you have to do. And yes, you have to do a bit of that in GP training, but you're starting to be able to shape your career. So are you gonna work full-time? Are you gonna work part-time? What does part-time mean? Is it just mornings? Is it just afternoons? Is it just two days a week? Is it just three days a week? What does that mean? Block work, do you wanna just work for a month and have a month off? Work for a month and then have a month off? These are the decisions you're gonna be making very soon. It's quite exciting when you come across these kind of decisions. What type of GP are you gonna be? Are you gonna be a partner, salary, locum? These are the traditional three choices that people talk about, but you guys are entering general practice or will be in a really exciting stage. Are you gonna be a digital GP? Are you gonna purely work out of hours? Are you gonna be a portfolio GP who does lots and lots of different things? These are all the choices that you're gonna to work towards in a couple of years time. What else do you wanna do apart from GP? Doing GP five days a week is absolutely fine, but you'll find these days there's so many other avenues that people talk about a lot more, whether it's med ed like I did, whether it's medical politics like Pooja did, whether it's medical insurance, medical legal, doctor up a nurse, setting up a business, aesthetics, so much stuff that you can do. That's just touching the tip, tip of the iceberg. Really, there's so many other things you can think about. These are the choices you're gonna have to come up with later on. Are you gonna be a gypsy? Do you wanna, do you have a passion for something else? Can you forge your career so you do a bit of primary care and a bit of something else? These are your choices that are gonna come up very soon but it's not about thinking about them in three or four years time. It's about starting to think about them now and how you can start to tailor your GPST one so that you can move down these avenues pretty early on. Are you going to take up fellowships? These are getting more and more important, um, more and more common now. By the time you come to the end of training, certainly there'll be more fellowships involved. Are you going to do private general practice? Are you going to go into a training scheme? So many choices are coming your way. So this is why You've worked so hard to get to this point. Now you're about to start this career where you have all these choices. A lot of hospital careers, you don't get that many choices. You just have to kind of follow the path and you do the kind of norm what most people do. General practice is completely different. So really happy for you guys that you're at this stage of your career because it's exciting. You should be excited, um, but of course nervous at the same time. So 10 things I'm going to talk about now as I go through um, and touch on some key things to think about right now with a month to go before your GP training. Number one, I remember feeling lost um, in the last few years, should be the first few weeks. And the last few weeks in the lead up to GP training, I felt very lost. And I remember very vividly feeling quite lost in the first few weeks of GP training as well. So this is not unusual, right? People are talking about feeling worried and anxious and scared. This is very normal. Um, so it's worth just getting your bearings right. Let's go through a few key things about GP training so that you kind of get your mind right as to how things are gonna progress. For a lot of you guys, and I know this, I was this myself, I applied for it, but I didn't really know what I was applying for. It was all about getting in, getting in, getting in, was now you've got to start thinking about, okay, what's actually going to happen? So of course, minimum three years is a special GP trainee. That is going to change. Years are getting more and more as time goes on. At least 18 months usually in an approved GP training practice. Some of you guys have got schemes where you're doing two years in GP now, which is great, but at least 18 months, depending on where you're currently working. Of course, your remaining months are in hospital rotations. They can be quite random, but most of them are going to be based around things that are very useful to General practice, A&E, acute medicine, pediatrics, elderly care, psych, ONG, ENT, these kind of things are very useful 
for uh, GP. And you might have your rotations already. I don't know. But let me know if you do have your rotations, if you're happy with them. Um, because a lot of people aren't when they come out, but we'll talk about how to make the most of them anyway in a second. And some of you guys may be having these more innovative posts that are starting to come across the UK now. So split week, for example, so two weeks GP, three weeks in hospital, or three weeks, uh, sorry, two days a week in GP, three days a week in hospital, or vice versa. So let me know again if you've got any of these innovative posts because they're becoming more and more popular um, as time goes on. Of course, at the end, your aim is to get CCT, completion, certificate of completion of training, where you come out with it as a GP. But in your three or four years or whatever you're doing, right now you need to achieve three things to, to to enable you to achieve mrcgp it's the only specialty where you have to get membership of a royal college as part of your completion of training right you have to get mrcgp to become a gp in the uk that consists of three things work-based place assessment which we'll talk about in a second the akt exam and currently the rca assessment but this is temporary by the time you guys come up to st3 it's going to be something different it's not going to be rca it'll probably be a combination of csa stroke rca and we'll talk about that in a second and at the end of every year at least you've got to clear an arcp an annual review of competency progress just like other training programs you've got to make sure you're demonstrating core things and we'll talk about this in a second as well so what are the kind of things to do when you feel lost or try and reduce that feeling of being lost? You've got to ask questions. Like I remember when I started GP training, I felt really not nervous, but I just felt really odd asking questions because I thought that and everyone knows this stuff and I should know this stuff. And maybe there's some guide out there that I should have read and I'm going to feel bad if I ask these questions. Look, ask as many questions as you can, right? You're in the same boat as everybody else. No one expects you to know everything at this point. You're in training and you're right at the beginning of training. So people expect you to ask questions, whether it's your PDs, your supervisors, people expect you to be able to ask questions. And we don't do that and therefore we miss out and therefore we worry and therefore we miss out on opportunities. Make sure you ask questions early. You're not expected to know everything. You're at the beginning of your training program. You're a trainee. So don't worry if you're asking things that you think are silly. I remember having questions early on and I thought, I just can't ask that because I'm going to sound silly. And what if, it, what if they think that I'm X, Y, Z? And looking back, I just wish, you know what, why not ask all these questions? Because now on the other side, and I'm dealing with trainees every day, people are asking me those questions that I had early on. So please don't um, feel bad about asking questions. The more questions you ask early on, the better your ride is going to be. The more quickly you're going to bed down, the less questions you ask, the more you kind of just fumble your way through the quicker you're going to get to a point kind of halfway through ST1 where you start thinking, oh gosh, I should have done this or I didn't really have to do this or um, I, I was supposed to do this, what, two months ago? And then it gets very, very stressful with all the other stuff that are going on, like on calls, et cetera. So please, 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 in the first one, two, three, four weeks, ask as many questions as you can because the more you ask, the more confident you get and the more you realize, actually, it's pretty straightforward in terms of my progress in the first year. So you're going to feel lost. Don't worry about it. Ask questions. It should settle down. I remember very clearly not knowing who is who. There's always acronyms going around. We've got a, a really busy GP training support group on Facebook, and a lot of you guys are mem members of that. Hopefully, Pooja can put a link out to that, actually, if, um, uh, if uh, do, 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 you guys are not. But I remember, and, and there's posts going out all the time about who, what's an ES, and what's a CS, and what's the difference between a PD and a TPD. So Let's just break down some of the commonest people that you're going to be coming across in the first couple of weeks to months of GPST1. So ES is your educational supervisor. This is the person who is responsible for your whole, not responsible, but the person who oversees your whole training. They're the one that you're going to meet very early that's going to be with you right till the end. It's usually your supervisor in your ST3 or your final year practice. So you, the person you're going to be with at the very end of GP training for the last year you meet them right at the beginning and they basically follow you through your training. So through all your hospital rotations, they kind of are ones that do your final review before it goes to ARCP. So all your assessments, all your logs, all your portfolios, we'll talk about in a second, all go through your ES. So your ES is really, really important. The moment you find out who your ES is, email them. Say, look, I'm XYZ. I'm coming to join you in, I don't know, 2023 or whatever it's going to be. Um, can I come and see you right now? Just just to kind of break the mold, because this is the person that you, that's going to get to know you inside out. And this is going to be one of the first people you go to when you have issues at any point in your training, training career. Your CS is your clinical supervisor, and they're the person that supervises you for every rotation. So if you're doing pediatrics, you'll get a CS, a clinical supervisor, who is a pediatrician in that department. If you're doing ENT, you'll move on to another clinical supervisor 
for your ENT. If you're doing GP as an ST1 or ST2, your clinical supervisor will be a GP in that practice. But this is different to your ES, remember. Your ES is your overall umbrella. Your CS is the one that's going to be um, looking at you from job to job basis, right? Uh, guys, I've just lost the, the chat for a second. Let me just make sure I've got you guys back up. Yeah, I've got you guys back up. Guys, just give me a yes if you can see, if you can still hear me, if you're still there, because um, I think I lost the chat for a second. Just give me a yes, guy. Yeah, good. Excellent. Phew, thought I'd lost you for a sec. Okay, so um, TPD or PD. So PD, Program Director, TPD, Training Program Director. They're basically synonymous words. Um, some areas use PD, some areas use TPD. But basically, these are the people that run your scheme, your training program. So they're going to be the people who have organized things like which rotation do you do, which jobs you do, which practice you end up in. They're the ones that arrange your regular teaching schedule right they arrange your whether it's your half day release every week whether it's one day every two weeks there's different areas have different programs in terms of training but your pds are your kind of mentors that will guide you through your training who are but are not directly involved in your training you see what i mean they're not involved in your practice they're not you might have an es who's also your tpd but this is supposed to be someone who kind of mentors you throughout your scheme and organize your training program so they'll book the courses you need to do they'll book the speakers to come and do events for example they might book your residentials if they happen in your area but they're the kind of people that you need to go to if you have issues that for example you feel you can't go to es with or issues that you want to go to two or three people because they're particularly big your pd is going to be high up on that list in terms of who's going to be there to support you throughout your three years now you may get put into a cluster so you might have a a vts scheme or vocational training scheme it's a bit of outdated term now but you may get a group of 30 of you you might get a group of 200 it depends on which area you are in the uk so therefore you might get a pd who looks after your little cluster which is a group of say 10 or 12 trainees and they kind of oversee your group do your teaching etc and you get to know them very very well so pds are going to be super important people as you go through your training ad area director Area dean, there's different people call them different things. So basically, these are people who supervise a patch. So for example, your, your local patch, an example, is East Birmingham VTS. So East Birmingham VTS scheme. Just give me a hi if you're, if you're in East Birmingham VTS scheme. That used to be one of my patches. I used to be a PD on East Birmingham VTS. So I like it a lot. Um, so that's the local TPD scheme. So that's the group that you will get together with on a weekly basis for training. And you have PDs that look after that particular patch. Then you have an area director which oversees a bigger patch containing multiple different BTSs. So, for example, you have Birmingham and Solihull patch, which contains a number of different BTS schemes, East Birmingham, South Birmingham, uh, Central. There's a few different ones in that patch. And your area director is the one that kind of oversees the whole patch. So if you get a problem developing in GP training and you think your PDs maybe can't you know, it's a level above this. It's something that it needs a little more higher up the ladder. The next person you'd be contacting is your AD, your area director. And then above them, you have the head of school. This is the person that you don't really want to ever meet, but you just want to know who they are. Like you'll get to know their name. You'll see their face on, on flyers or whatever it might be on websites. But the head of school is the person responsible for a whole area. So for example, East Birmingham BTS is part of Birmingham and Solihull patch. Birmingham and Solihull Patch is part of the West Midlands Deanery, as you like. It used to be called the Deanery. Now it's Health Education West England, uh, West Midlands, sorry. And they cover several different areas, which in turn contain several different programs or VTS schemes. So don't worry too much about the organizational side of it, but just get to know these acronyms. Your ES is super, super important throughout your training. Your CS is super important for each rotation that you do. And your PD or your TPD is also the global overseer of your training as a whole group. Give me a yes, guys, if that kind of makes sense, because there's lots of posts going on on our GP training group right now about who's the ES, what's my CS, who do I contact, et cetera. So let me know if that kind of makes sense. Good, 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 good. Excellent. Because I remember feeling a little bit lost about these kind of people, and I didn't ask questions, and then I kind of went to the wrong people for the wrong things, and it all got a little bit converted. So um, hopefully that should... Um, set things through and also would these people make the first move right i remember not doing this and i remember thinking later on i should have done this because i should have what i should have done is with well, the moment i found out my es the moment i found out my cs in my first rotation 
the moment I found out who my PDs were, I should have emailed them. I should have made the initiative. I should have taken the chance to do it and said, look, I'm, I'm, an, um, I'm gonna be in your practice or your, your rotation or whatever, just wanted to say hi. Like it's amazing how much impact these things make. So if you make the first move, it's gonna put you in a really good position. If you kind of wait and think, well, you know, they're busy or, you know, I'll do it late or whatever, they'll have to contact you and it's not the best start. They've got so many people to manage, so many things going on in their own careers to make sure you make the first move. Practice manager down there as well, because if you're about to do a GP rotation, GPSD1, GPSD2, in general practice, this person is super important to get to know very early. Drop them a line. Hi, I'm Dr. XYZ. I'm coming to your practice in a month. Um, can I come and say hi? Because your PM is a person that's going to manage so much of your training, your rotors, your on calls, your timings, your computer logins. So make the initiative, get in there first. And all these people, because of their importance, because you don't know when you're going to need them, make sure you make the first move and get them to know you before they have to know you, if you see what I mean. Number three, I forgot I was a GP20 in hospital rotation. This is really important. I've just come out of F1, F2, and you know, I was a hospital doctor. And then I went into GP training and I started in a hospital rotation. And I kept forgetting throughout my IDD ENT, I did pediatrics, ONG, um, and a few others. And I just kept forgetting I was a GP trainee. And you just got to keep telling yourself, look, I'm in training. This is my training program. Yes, I am doing ENT. Yes, I'm doing a &E. Yes, I have to do certain things that have to be done in that rotation, but I'm a GP trainee and I have my needs. And you have to sometimes push this a little bit, first through your own mind, but also through the people that are training as well. Because if, if you don't make the effort to show people that it's important that you're developing as a GP trainee, then sometimes it becomes a bit of service provision and you get a little bit frustrated by what's going on. And that certainly happened to me in one of my rotations before I started to think of myself as a GP trainee. So think like a GP, these are simple things. Like say, for example, you're doing a, I don't know, an on-call in, I don't know, ONG or something, and someone comes in with, with menorrhagia. Yes, do what you have to do in terms of your ONG rotation, do the clerking, do the examination, do the bloods, et cetera. But think a little bit at times. If it's not busy, obviously, if it's chaos, you just do what you have to do. But if it's not busy, think, start thinking like a GP. Okay, if I was seeing this lady and on Friday evening on my own in a GP setting with no bloods or anything about, how would I approach this? Like, what would I do? When would I think about picking up the, the phone and speaking to somebody? What would I, when would I do the investigations? How long could I leave it? Like, these are the kind of things that you can start doing very early on, but you've got to remind yourself that you're a GP trainee. If you don't, you'll just whiz through four months of rotation, do what you have to do and come out the other end and think, well, that was great, but um, you know, it wasn't very useful. So remember to keep reminding yourself that you are a GP trainee and start thinking like one particularly on the quieter days, because you can get so much value out of your secondary care rotations, even if you don't think that you need this rotation for general practice, there's so much you can learn. And then when you're doing hospital specific rotations, make sure you grab the opportunities that are there that are very useful for you as a GP trainee. So for example, if you have to do loads of theater, if you're doing, if you're doing TNO or you know whatever it might be, or vascular, and, and you have to do loads of theater, fine, do all that stuff, but get used to stuff that you're going to be finding valuable in a few months time in GP land. So for example, get to know what the consents are all about because people in primary care are going to come and see you and say, look, I've been, I've been told I need this operation, but I'm a bit worried about the risks. Should I have it done or not? So if you got used to doing consents, for example, you know these kind of risks, you can talk about them and have a conversation, very primary care led. Counseling, for example, um, knowing how to counsel somebody before a really big operation. That's, that's, that's something that's invaluable. And very often you get that through doing theatre work, as opposed to just sitting there and doing theatre work, if you see what I mean. But you can do either or. You can either just do the job, or you can start to look for opportunities that you allow yourself to think like a GP trainee. Clinics, really important. Um, gypsy clinics, just jump into clinics and try and again, if you have time, try and think like a GP. Okay, you're doing an ENT clinic, right? And someone's come in with, I don't know, recurrent ear discharge. Yeah, you know, do what you have to do in ENT. But just think, if this person came to see me in GP land with recurrent ear discharge, would I have referred at this point? What do the guidelines say? How, what has been tried so far in primary care? Have any investigations been done in primary care? Like think about this kind of stuff, go back through the history and think like a GP because in a few months time, you're gonna be seeing this person in your own clinic. So thinking like that is really important. If you don't do it, you don't, okay, you don't, nothing really happens, but you just lose that opportunity because you haven't thought like a GP trainee and you've forgotten that you're a GP trainee first and foremost. MDTs, yes, you know, you have to do them and, and you know, sometimes you just have to do them. But in MDTs, think about the primary care angle. You know, when people are talking and doing all this stuff and you're not really involved, 
think about what people are saying. Think about what OT is saying. Think about what physio is saying. Think about what all these people are saying in relation to primary care. Like, how is this all linking in the community? How is somebody going to go and actually access physio in the community when they're having it in hospital right now? Like, these are the kind of things you should be thinking about in hospital rotations because you're thinking like a GP20. Because if you don't, you're going to miss out on them. And then when it comes to AKT and RCA or whatever, you're thinking, oh, gosh, how does it all work? And now I have to revise all of these, these stuff. Whereas actually, you could have learned it two months before. Audits, yes, got to do them. Of course, sometimes you've got to do quips, et cetera. We'll talk about that in a second. But try and think about primary care based ones. Yes, sometimes you're told what to do in secondary care rotations because they have to be done. But sometimes you get open board. If you get open board, think about what's going to help me in primary care. And can I almost do something that I can almost replicate in primary care later for my main quip? Because you're going to have to do one in ST3. So why don't you do something that you can use a bit of the writer, for example, there? But again, it's just thinking ahead rather than just going through the motions. I went through the motions in at least two of my rotations. I thought differently for another two. And the difference was huge in terms of what I took out of those rotations. And even simple things like, yes, you've got to do TTOs. Yes, you've got to write discharge summaries. But think about it from GP land side. Okay, if I was a GP and I was going to get this letter, what are the three or four things that are highly valuable for me to know on that side? Like, yes, get through them and do the job, et cetera. But sometimes just think on the other side. Like, you know, maybe I don't need all these 15 lines. Maybe these two or three lines are the most important because they're the ones that I need to know as a GP on the other side. But again, the more you think about this, the more value you're going to get from these rotations. The less you think about them, probably the longer these rotations are going to seem. And you're going to come out and think, well, what was that all about? Like, I don't really learn anything because I hear this a lot, but it's about what you put in. But none of that happens if you don't think like a GP trainee. And you can't think like a GP trainee unless you remember that you're a GP trainee. And I forgot this too many times and it cost me a little bit. So make sure you don't fall on that side. Before we finish, we've got a, a blog on this. And um, by the way, guys, in the handout section, there should be a handout section in your little dashboard. We have our new GP trainee ebook. So it's a free ebook. And it covers loads of stuff about starting GP training and the kind of things to think about. So just download that ebook. If you can't do it from there, then Pooja might be able to put a link in the chat or something. Um, yeah, she's put the link there. Fantastic. Thanks, Pooja. Oh, hi, Pooja. So I don't know what time you came on board, but um, yeah, uh, welcome. Welcome. I hope um, Dehan is asleep and sleeping soundly. Okay, so yeah, what did you do before your rotation? We've got a big blog on this, we've got a video on this as well, but a few things to stand out. Number one, like I said, contact the relevant people, contact your clinical supervisor, contact practice managers, get in touch with people before they get in touch with you because it shows initiative. Speak to someone who's done it before. I wish I'd done this. Like I went into an ST1 rotation, I think it's my second rotation, and I went into a job and Obviously, I, I was, it was my second job in ST1. So somebody had done that rotation before, and I was already in ST1 because I'd done a rotation before. So I could have found somebody who's done that rotation and spoken to them. Because when I went there, there's so many things I didn't know, like who to go to, what room. Like, there's just so much stuff I had to work out myself. All I had to do was speak to someone about it. And it's amazing how many of you don't do that. So please try and grab someone. And even if you don't know anybody, just ask a PD, do you know any trainees who have done this before? and drop them an email. It's amazing how much stress you reduce by doing that. Think about your assessment before you start a rotation. We'll talk about assessment in a second. Think about which ones are mandatory for me to do in this rotation, and which ones can I do in this rotation that really I can only really do in this rotation, so I things I don't want to miss out on. Think about this stuff before you start the rotation, because once you're two, three weeks into it, you're already catching up. Think about your PDP, which we'll talk about in a second. Think about what do I need to get out of this rotation? What can I get out of this rotation? And get it in your mind before you start, because when you start it's so busy, and before you know it, you're going to be scrambling to get any old PDP. Think about it beforehand. Plan your clinics. If you're doing an ENT rotation, think about, I want to do these three. Whatever I do, I must go to these three clinics. I must do it. If you're doing pediatrics, I must go to, I don't know, a pediatric asthma clinic. I must go to a pediatric gait clinic. Whatever it is that you think might be useful for you, Plan it in advance, because if you don't plan it in advance, you'll get put into things. And if you get put into things, that's when people come out saying, well, that wasn't really useful. Think about your weaknesses. Okay, when I was doing ENT, I had no idea how to use an oroscope properly. I had no idea. I, I, I'd done it in med school, but I don't know how I did it in med school. I didn't really see much. So I knew by the end of these four months, I have to come out confident about using an oroscope. Why? Because it's primary care. Like you, you do it all the time. So by the end, I knew I'd nailed it because I thought about it before. So make sure you think about your weaknesses and try and hone down on them. Because you know what we're like, we human beings, we tend to try and go to things that we feel comfortable with. But 
you're missing out on opportunities if you don't do that. And make sure you plan your leave, guys. So many times in training, when I was a PD, and even now, people say, like, I missed out on my leave because I didn't plan it. And therefore, you don't plan it, things don't happen. And Or you get forced into the leave that you don't want to take. So make sure you plan this in advance. Before every rotation, think about these simple things. Like I said, we've got a blog on it, we've got a video on it. Um, simple things make a big difference in your training. And then try and max each job that you do. Yes, there's going to be some rotations that you don't like. Yes, there's going to be some rotations that you really didn't want to do, but you're in it, right? You Sometimes you can't change it. At least try and maximize your four or six months. Number one, get your basics done early on. Like if you know you have three or four mandatory assessments to do, get them done in the first month. Just nail them on the head so you know the rest of the time you're not stressed about having to find somebody to do a steps or whatever it is that you need to do by the end. Get the basics done early, put a target in place. Don't just do service vision like we said, make sure you have your own needs, but that means you have to think about that proactively. Create the opportunities that are there because there are so many and they're never there if you're not looking. But if you start looking and you plan it, there are so many things you can do in your rotations and keep telling yourself, look, I may never do P's again. I may never do ONG again. Yes, I don't really like it at this point, but I'm never gonna do it again, but I'm gonna do a whole lot of it in primary care. So let me just grab it, do what I can. And because it's only a very short bit in my career, four months, six months is nothing in your 30, 40, 50 year career, right? Try and max it out because you're never gonna get that chance again. PDP we briefly mentioned earlier on, um, the whole, you've been in PDPs, I know you, um, before, it's not the first PDP you're doing, but the whole point is that you're supposed to identify, plan, and then document your learning needs as you go through. So having a bit of thinking behind this is important, otherwise it'll put anything down. Always it's a balance, of course, you've got to be smart when it comes to PDP, not just smart in the writing, SMART, but smart in what you think about. Balance, balance between the kind of things that I'd have to do anyway in this rotation versus what I want to add on additionally. And if you go to um, our website, there's a blog, it's in the ebook as well. We've broken down 21 of the commonest rotations endocrinology, ENT, psychiatry, and we've put 10 PDPs in there. So think if, if you're struggling to think about PDPs, then just go to that blog. Pooja, maybe if you can put that blog in the chat, that'd be really helpful. Um, but it's in the ebook. And it'll just give you an idea about what are the kind of things that I should be thinking about as a GP trainee, even if you haven't got them yourself. Um, and just yeah, have a look at it because it, I know a lot of people screenshot it and it just makes a big difference. Number four, I remember being completely, completely overwhelmed by the portfolio. Now the portfolio has changed. Um, in 2020, a new portfolio started and there's been mixed feelings. A lot of people do think it's a lot better than the other one, but a portfolio is a portfolio and it's gonna be busy. It's gonna have lots of stuff in there. It's gonna have lots of terms that you would never heard of before, but also ones that you have heard of in the past but it's just something that has to be done, right? It's part and parcel of training, it's part and parcel of being a clinician at this point. So new version from 2020, um, basically this is your, like this is you in a snapshot. Like when it comes to ARCP, it's your portfolio is the only thing that people have to judge you by. So you've got to have everything in there documented from start to finish to show, this is how I have progressed through my training. This is my evidence that I'm giving you to allow me to complete. It's not just about the exams. You've got to make sure your portfolio is up to scratch and it demonstrates certain things. We'll talk about again in a second, but start to finish. Like day one of GP training, your evidence is starting. It's a zero and you've got to build it up to a certain point by the end. So if you, like I, this was me, right? I didn't touch my portfolio for the first, I don't know, month. I just, I don't know, pretended it wasn't there. I was just like, well, it's not there. Like it happened, whatever. Everyone else is not doing it. Everyone else is doing it. And I just left it. And then all of a sudden, it's like a month has gone. My PD is like, well, look, your portfolio is blank. And I was like, well, mm, isn't everybody else's? No, everybody else is doing all these things. Why? Because I just, I just, A, I was probably scared of it. Um, and B, I just thought, well, it's too overwhelming. Um, and C, I didn't just jump in. Like the moment you jump in, you start to play around with it. Just click on everything, see what everything does. And you start to get less scared because it's something that you've got to get used to. And it's your evidence, right? If you have a month of a blankness, and people can start to wonder why, what's going on? Are you turning up? What's happening? Document your progress. All your assessments are logged in here. We'll talk about assessments in a second. All your learning, you log in. All the assessments, other people log in, but it's all there for people to see. Uses the basis, like I said, for ARCP, which we'll talk about. And your portfolio is accessible by you, so you can do things to it. Your um, supervisors, of course, because they have to do reports and assessments, et cetera. People that you allow short-term access, like registrars that can do a one-off assessment, for example. And then of course, admins in the deanery who use it because they have to use it for ARCP, et cetera. So uh, lots of people are gonna have access to it. So make sure it's pinpoint and make sure you understand it very early on. 
don't worry too much about this, but these are all the learning log types. So you're gonna have to get very used to these types of things. Some of them, of course, you've, you've done before. Some of them are brand new, placement planning meetings. So every time you start a new placement, you've got to document a placement planning meeting. So make sure these things are all in place. Clinical case reviews, you've got to produce CPD and documentation of all your learning, significant events, feedback. So again, your patient feedback, your colleague feedback, all these things are things that you've probably done before, but they're gonna remain throughout your training. Leadership um, learning logs, you have, these are new, fairly new. You have to make sure you're demonstrating some avenues in leadership. SEPs is all about your examinations. So can you demonstrate your ability to do certain core examinations that you're, they're kind of mandatory, but also some other ones that you think might be useful that you want to put in there as well. So SEPs are all about examinations. Quips, quality improvement activities, audits, etc. Prescribing reviews, there's a couple of things that come in ST3, which you don't need to worry about at this point, but things just worth hearing these words because um, I remember when I got to ST3, there was just brand new stuff that I never, th never thought about before. And then there's some other stuff for academic training as well. So some of you guys might be there uh, doing academic stuff. There's some stuff for you as well. But don't worry too much about this now. But when you first get your portfolio access and you get all that done, you might have it. Uh, you might start to have it soon. Just start to look at all these things. Look at the RCGP website to try and figure out what these all are. Just so it's not going to surprise you when you suddenly have to do it. Because suddenly in ST1, in your first rotation, you'll have so many that you need to do of these things. And you don't have to work it all out the second before you're trying to ask somebody to do it on you because it's very, very stressful. So just make sure you go through all of them. Portfolio is there to be maximized. It's your portfolio. You've got to embrace it. Like you, you can't you can't go through training without embracing it at some point because ultimately you 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 have to embrace it by force because your ARCP comes up, so you have to make it right. You might as well do it from the beginning. Document everything. Even if the first few things that you do are not really great, it doesn't matter. It's all about progression. It's supposed to show how you change from day one to day X. So just document everything, whether you think it's good or bad. Um, know what's required of you. Like there's, there's one thing to just document a whole load of stuff, but then you miss out on the mandatory stuff. You have to get your mandatory stuff in right and make sure you understand what that is first. Set targets. This is super important because if you don't set targets, you don't put learning logs in. If you don't set targets, like I want to do X number of entries per month, X number of rotations per job, not just the mandatory ones, always go beyond mandatory because if you just do mandatory, they'll be like, well, you just did mandatory. One is not great. Now you're falling behind, but you've got to set targets, right? If you don't set targets, nothing happens. And remember, it's all about reflection. It's not recording. We've got a whole, yeah, we've got a video on reflection, how to do it. We've got a blog on reflection. It's in the ebook. You've got to learn to reflect, but don't worry if you, if you don't think you're going to reflect at the beginning. It's a process. You may start by recording but that will turn into reflection as time goes on but make sure it's a reflective portfolio it's not a recorded portfolio because people don't want to read what you've done they want to learn and read about what's come out of it and that's the reflection part but have a look at that blog on reflection if you struggle with reflection because i did and actually it's quite a simple process once you break it down number five I had no idea how important proper planning was. Well, actually, that's a lie. I knew how important planning was because everyone told me you need to plan, but it didn't mean that I did it. So like I said, the first few rotations, I didn't do any planning and I suffered. I just got stressed towards the end because I hadn't planned things through. So make sure you plan everything really well. Plan your week, plan your month, plan your rotation, plan your whole year, because there are so many things that have to be done in certain time frames before the end of each rotation, like I mentioned, before the end of ARCP. Exams need to be booked, study needs to happen. There are courses that you wanna go on. Make sure you plan, have a diary, have it on the wall. I remember from my ST2 onwards, I had a massive wall calendar and I just put everything in there, all my on-calls, all my out of hours, um, all the, the exams, the preps, the courses, just everything. And it made my life so much easier because it took everything out of here and it put it on there. So I don't have to worry about remembering anything. I used to put down, okay, by the end of this week, I need this many, um, they weren't called SEPs then, they're called DOPs, for example, but I knew I had to tick off certain numbers and I made sure I planned it. So it was done by the first half of the rotation. Like I wasn't leaving it to the last couple of weeks because I knew I just get super stressed. Plan the assessments, plan your exam prep, plan your leave. Like I said, if you don't plan them, you don't get them or you, you do get them when you don't want them. Tell someone your plan. This is super important. You've got to become accountable stuff. There's one thing to just to say, I'm going to do this, 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 but you've got to tell someone to really push it through. And the person that I started telling ST2 was my ES. I started saying to my, I said to my ES, this is my plan, right? But every month I'm going to do this much. Every month there's going to be this many learning logs on your thing to look through. Every month I'm going to do this many mini kexes. Now, once I put that in an email to my ES, it drove me to do it. 
Like, it's one thing to say, I'm going to do it, but you know what our brains are like. It's just like, yeah, whatever, we'll do it tomorrow. But if you told somebody, particularly someone as important as your ES, that you end up respecting that does your assessments, it pushes you through. So number one, plan it. Number two, become accountable to somebody higher up the ladder so that you end up doing it. And number three, three must-dos a day. I do this even now. Um, I, every night, I think, okay, what are the three things I have to do tomorrow? Now, this doesn't have to just work stuff, but just three things that must be done. And it's amazing when you focus your brain on these three things, rather than thinking, I've got 100 things to do, think of three little things in GP training to do every single day, whether it's do three logs, whether it's do an assessment. And it's amazing how many times by, say, midday, you've done them because you're, you're focusing so much on these three things that just get done. Otherwise, they get left and left and left and left. And before you know it, the stress builds, you have a crazy on call, you run out of time, you can't fire an assessor, and then you're struggling. So try and think about this three must do a days, become accountable and make sure you plan really well. Number six, I had no idea, and this is a genuine thing, I had no idea how difficult days they were gonna be, how many difficult days they were gonna be. Now, you guys have done medicine, you've worked already in, in various uh, areas and sections and whatever, maybe different countries. You know they were difficult days, right? And and I, I went through F1, F2, and I'll be honest, I didn't really have that many difficult days. I, I didn't really have much going on. Um, I just kind of breezed through it. I don't even know how I did it, but I just did it. GP training, I started getting some difficult days because lots of stuff started happening. Number one, maybe it was the feeling, like, okay, now this is my training program. This is not just a single one-year thing. This is, I've got to get three years. I've got to do X, Y, Z. And it became a lot more stressful for me. So you're going to be overwhelmed at some point. Let's just be open about it. You're going to be overwhelmed. There's no point thinking, I'm great, I'm fine, I'll be, I'll be okay. You've got to prepare for tough days because tough days are going to come. Whether that's tough because of curriculum stuff, like you've got to suddenly fill in a whole bunch of stuff, you're missing things, you're struggling to get your curriculum signed up, whether it's exams, we haven't even talked about exams yet, but AKT, RCA, these are big things, big hurdles that are coming up. Whether it's on calls, you know, due to job or GP on calls, whatever it might be, life, yeah, life events, like life events happen, you can't predict them, but you're going to feel overwhelmed at some point. It's just going to happen. But there are key things you can do to make sure it doesn't hit you as hard as it possibly can. Number one, know your go-to, is plan this in advance. Know when you are going through a tough time, who are you going to go to? Whether that's an ES, if you've got a good relationship with them, whether it's a PD, whether it's a certain friend, you've chosen them, these are the people, you've told them that do you mind if I come to you if I'm struggling. Have your go-tos because the last thing is that when you're going through a stressful time, you then try and figure out who's the person I need to go to. That's just so stressful. Have it in your mind. Hopefully, you never need to use them for this purpose, but know these are the people that I'm going to pick up, pick the phone up, write an email, whatever. Go early. Um, never be afraid of this. You know, I think as medics, we don't do this, and therefore we leave it too late, and then things get even worse. So go early. Have your go-tos in place, but then use it. Go early. You know, if nine times out of ten you say something to them and it doesn't really, you don't need it, great. But the one time you went early, then it makes a difference as opposed to the other way around where you actually end up losing it, you don't get the benefit of going to your person. So go early and then, like I said, have your plan in place when things are difficult, not if things, when things are difficult, this is what I'm gonna do. And please make sure you plan your U time. Like whatever, however busy it gets, however crazy it gets, people talk about this a lot, make sure you plan your U time, two, three days out, trips, um, just whatever, just U time. If you don't have U time, you are going to make these things feel even bigger than they normally would do. Okay, this helped us so far. I've gone through, I think, six. How does this work so far? Have I just rambled on? Has it made sense? Is it just saying silly things that you already know about? Like, tell me, is this helpful? Give me some feedback before we go on a little break. Good. Good, 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 helpful, useful, good, feeling better, good, good. Good, 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 good. Excellent. Really glad to hear it. Um, look, these things might sound simple, but Gosh, no one talked about them before. I went inside GP training and I had to work it out myself. So I'm really, really glad that these things are um, having some value. We've got plenty more to come after the break. Okay, so as promised, guys, the coupons, um, two things um, will be helpful, I think, as GPST ones. One is our new GP training gold package. It's three things, it contains three things I'll talk about in a second. But if you already know you want this, then the coupon is 15 GPST one, one five GPST one, 10 coupons each. That's your gold package. And then there's the triple bundle as well. Now, a lot of you guys might have used some of these ones at some point. So there's a couple of double bundles and they're also the single ones, a coupon will work as well. But it's mainly based with a triple bundle, clinical guideline cards, pharmacology cards, and medical explanation cards. They're quick, they're short, they're simple, they keep them taken around with you, useful for revision, for AKT, et cetera, and also day-to-day -day life. So those are three, two, three things, no, two things, but three things 
15 GP ST1. Pooja, hopefully we'll put the, the links back in the chat. Let me just break down the goal package for you. If you're not sure, there was three things. Number one, this contains our GPST1 trainee online max course. It's a half day course that you can pause, rewind, go back to as much as you like. It comes with a 12 month package if you get it as the GPST1 gold. And these are all the things that it covers in detail. So a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, but way more depth. So you kind of know what's coming in your GPST1 year. So it comes with that. It comes with our clinical GPST1 50 presentations and how to manage them. So if you've been doing a lot of hospital medicine, thinking like a GP trainee in your GP rotations can sometimes be quite difficult. So what I do, I break down 50 of the commonest presentations, back pain, menorrhagia, depression, et cetera, and look at how do you focus on them from a GP mindset. So that's an audio book that has no expiry. You can listen to it again and again and again. And then our 51 principles to max your GP training. So things that we talk about that get you to really make the most of your training because a lot of people it slips by and you miss the opportunities this kind of just gets you through thinking about those things some of them we talked about just now that kind of thing about making sure you get the most of your rotations and normally all these three things is 207 it's normally down to 147 as a bundle but the extra 15 percent off today gives you for 125 so that's your gold training pack then you have your three in one cards so you have your clinical guideline cards we've just literally updated them so you'll be getting the brand new ones that got, we got delivered on friday so they're all up to date with current nice cks guidance all the kind of primary care stuff that you need to know for your exam then we've got our pharmacology cards with that as well so the key drugs the side effects the contraindications the, the stuff you need to know for your exams and also your medical explanation cards how to explain 150 conditions in really simple layman terms that you can use both in primary care and secondary care and certainly for your exams. So that's our triple bundle. All three together is normally 170. Normally is 120 as the bundle, but an extra 15% off to date makes it 102. So that's 15 GPST1 is the coupon for both those, right? So I'm gonna leave this up for a couple of minutes. Please grab a drink, have a bit of a stretch and we'll restart in two minutes time and we'll cover those final four things that you need to think about before you start GP training. Thank you guys, welcome back. Lots and lots and lots of questions coming in. So I'll try and quickly answer a couple of them. I, will, what I forgot to say at the beginning of the webinar actually, with questions, I try not to answer them in the middle of the, the webinar because it just gets really, there's so many questions, it gets very bitty. So I do, see them and I do go back at the end I promise you and I will go through some of the questions because there's been really good questions coming through actually really important questions when it comes to GP training so I definitely will um, be going back through some of them there's questions about research there's questions about um, PDPs questions about reflection um, about other other um, doing other kind of diplomas and things in the middle and that's a very common question so I will talk about these I promise as we go forward but we are going to get cracking again um, people are asking about the expiry of the, the, the new GP trainee gold package. So this is a 12 month program. So the online course is 12 months, but the audio books have no expiry. So basically you're looking at 12 months plus um, for the gold pack. People are asking about delivery of the bundles. So if you were to purchase tonight, then we post tomorrow morning and you should get them within one to three working days. And Royal Mail all tracked. Um, and that's a triple bundle pack. And there's people saying, if I've already got the clinical ones, can I get these two? Yes. Yeah, so you, there are a couple of other bundles and combinations on the website um, of these three, or you can get the individual cards as well, either the clinical or the pharma or the explanation cards, depending on which ones you have already. Uh, unable to open the link. Oh, by the way, just people ask about the Facebook link. I've just put the Facebook support group in the chat as well. So if you have a click on that, some of you guys might be a part of that, but we do do daily teaching, daily updates for GP training, all about the exams, the dates, everything's on that group. So, and there's a lot of discussion between trainees about portfolio and, and, and PDPs and all that kind of stuff. So please do make sure you join that group if you can. And I also put a link to the free teaching emails that we do every day, which I'll talk about in a second um, as we get onto it. But I'm gonna move on. Um, before we get into the next section, so the ebook that we're talking about, this is our GPST1 ebook. Hopefully, you guys have grabbed that already or downloaded it. You might have already seen it before. If you haven't, it goes into much more depth about some of the stuff that I've been talking about tonight. So please do see if you can get that. It's in the handout section if you want it, or you can download it. And these are our upcoming webinars. We do regular webinars, as you guys know. So if you are preparing for GB entry, if you're doing an MSRA, um, then we have an MSRA webinar uh, next week. Yeah, next week. We have an ENT update, we do regular update, clinical 
um, webinars. We did a cardiology one a couple of weeks ago. Our next one is our ENT one in August. And then we have regular AKT ones as well. So if you're doing AKT later, which you guys will be, then you might want to start joining these AKT webinars from early on. So you start to understand a little bit about what this exam is all about. You're not going to have the stress level that all the others are going to have that are doing it in six to eight weeks, but at least you start to figure out what the exam is all about. So it might be worth joining some of those. And they're all on the webinar page, the same page that you signed up for this webinar. Pooja, if you can put a link at some point for the webinar page, um, that'd be really helpful. And if you are playing a bit of MSRA, by the way, it's worth remembering nine Oh yeah, the time has gone actually. There was a 20% off all MSRA resources using this coupon. It's supposed to be nine o'clock end, but um, I haven't switched it off because I'm on the webinar. So if you are praying for MSRA and you want 20 off any of our MSRA products, then see if you can use that coupon, MSRA20. I'll have to switch that off after this webinar, so the moment we finish. Okay, number seven out of 10. I remember being overwhelmed by assessments. I've talked about assessments already. This is not an exam. These are the assessments, the work-based place assessments. They used to freak me out because I used to think, oh gosh, I'm running out of time and there's no one around to do these assessments for me. And it used to cause me a lot of panic. So planning is a really important thing. But what is work-based placed assessment or work-placed-based assessment? Was it confused? Super important, okay? This is the third of your MRCGP. People just think of MRCGP is AKT and CSA or AKT and RCA. It's not. That's just two-thirds. Yes, you have to pass your exams to get your MRCGP. Fine. But there are so many trainees, unfortunately, I have seen in my career who have passed AKT, who have passed CSA stroke RCA, but they didn't pass WPBA. And therefore, they didn't complete GP training, and therefore, they didn't end up with MRCGP. Now, that is a travesty, right? If you And workplace based assessment starts in the very first post of GP training, and it ends in the last month of your ST3 or ST4, or however many years you do GP training for. It's the continuous assessments that you have throughout your GP training that make up a third of your overall degree. So it is super, super important to get ahead of this early on and tick things off almost earlier than you have to, just so you're not having that stress. So it's, it's supposed to basically test things that can't be tested in those exam environments, right? So stuff that AKT can't test, Stuff that RCA can't test, this is being tested in WBBA. Things that are tested over time, and they're basically recorded and reported in your portfolio by a variety of different trainers, supervisors, other doctors, healthcare professionals, and all of your assessments are ultimately based on or mapped to the 13 RCGP capabilities. If you haven't heard of the 13 RCGP capabilities, have a look at the RCGP curriculum. It's covered in our online course. You need to know these, but these are things that you need to map your training and assessments towards. So these are examples then of some of the assessments that come as part of your workplace place assessment, right? There are so many. And again, I wouldn't worry too much about the nitty gritties of them. Some of them cross over with the learning logs as well, because there's assessment parts in there. So for example, you've got your mini CEXs that are things that you do observed clinical encounters done in hospital. You have COTS, which are your observed clinical um, consultations done in general practice. That's like different things I look for, of course. Audio cots, a lot more audio work going on in GP land at the moment. Case-based discussions you guys would have done anyway in F1, F2 probably at some point. Prescribing assessments, you've got your usual MSF and PSQs which have to be done. Quips like we talked about. And then some newer things like CATs, for example, care assessment tools. And again, I wouldn't worry too much about these just at this point. Just start to get used to some of the names a little bit. And then you get your CSR, ESR, these are important, your CSR and your ESR, people often get confused with these two things. So your CSR is your clinical supervisor's board, so at the end of every four-month rotation or six-month rotation, <coughs> your clinical supervisor does a report on how you've been, what have you ticked off, how have you, been, how have you engaged, they go through your assessment, and they write up a report. Now, your ESR is, is, is your annual or six monthly report written by your educational supervisor based on all the evidence that is in your portfolio as well as based on your CSR report. So they look at the clinical supervisor report, but ultimately they need to write an educational supervisor report, which is the basis of ARCP. So what they use predominantly to look out for an ARCP, which we'll talk about in a second. So both of these are super important but they're based heavily on some of the assessments that you do throughout your training. 
So I wouldn't worry too much about this. Like I said, we do go into these in much more depth in the online course. You will get used to these, but just don't be afraid of them and, and just jump in. Like start doing them early. Don't do what I did with the first few rotations and leave them to the end and then stress because you're trying to find people to do these things and they're never around when you need them. Number eight, exams. I had no idea how quickly these were going to come. I was ST1. I was living in, in, in a great world. You need all these exams in the future. And yeah, at some point I've got to do AKT, but I don't need to worry about it now. And I wish I'd, you know, I wish I did. I started planning all about probably three or four months ago. I wish I started planning, I don't know, even a year to go. Remember AKT, you can't do until ST2, but that doesn't mean you don't think about it until ST2. One thing I'd definitely say, start thinking about it in ST1 onwards. Because if you don't, it's going to catch up with you and you realize there's so much to learn. So two main exams or assessments, it used to be exams, AKT, Applied Knowledge Test, we'll talk about that in a second. The one that's considered the smaller one, but it's actually not the smaller one. Loads of people don't pass AKT because they don't plan it properly. Um, and then RCA, Recorded Consultation Assessment, is the temporary replacement for CSA, Clinical Skills Assessment. I'll talk about this in a second. Both very possible but both very easily failable as well. And, and I've got to say, failure rates are going up. I've seen, I've noticed that um, because whether the exams are getting tougher, I don't know, but certainly I've seen a lot more people fail AKT, for example, than I used to maybe four or five years ago. So you need to get on it early on. And we we for this, we do lots of plans. So we have countdown programs. So for example, our biggest countdown program is our 270-day countdown program. So if you're doing, for example, those people who are doing AKT in April 22 will start their 270-day, day-by-day countdown guide in July, this end of this month. So that's how much we say you need to be thinking ahead. So we have 270 countdowns, we have 180-day countdown, we have a 150-day countdown, we have a 120-day countdown, a 90-day, a 60-day, and a 30-day, depending on whenever you start. I would suggest get the 270 day countdown. We're even gonna think about a 360 day countdown. So you might be able to use that if you're thinking about ST2. Plan well, plan early, we'll talk about this in a second. You're always preparing like ST1, you're starting AKT preparation, you should be anyway, even whether you're doing it subconsciously or not. And you've got to take advantage of passive learning because it's not one of those exams you can say, right, now I'm in AKT zone, let's start. Like you've got to use passive learning because there's so much to, to take into your mind You've got to almost be learning when you're not trying to be learning. We'll talk about how we can help with that in a second. So AKT, applied knowledge, right? Not do you know the 16 causes of heart failure? It's okay, now you know the 16 causes of heart failure. Now you see a patient who comes up with this. What do you think might be the most reasonable thing to do first point in primary care when four of those things are actually pretty reasonable in the answers? That's applied. That's tough. That's not just do a whole load of reading, cram everything in, and then pass the exam. You've got to get into the mindset of, okay, this is primary care and maybe three things are right, but I've got to make the gut decision about which is the right one to do right now based on guidelines, based on gut instinct, based on history. That's tough. So you've got to have preparation in the applied mindset. It's not just a knowledge test and people often fall down on that. 200 questions, three hours, 10 minutes, about 57 seconds per question-ish. Um, doesn't sound very much, but or it might sound a lot, but it goes fast. Break down three areas. 80% of questions are clinical, 10% are stats, 10% is admin. Don't ignore stats and admin. People do that. They think, oh, I'll just get, I'll just nail this bit and forget this bit. You can't nail clinical because it's applied. You're going to make mistakes and you're going to get things wrong. And before you know it, the 10% on these two drop you down before the mask. You've got to focus on all three. Lots of different question types, mainly SBA, so mainly single best answer, five options, one, which is what's the best. Some EMQs are multiple answers, 15 different answers, for example, and, you, and the same answers across three or four different questions. And there are a few others as well, like typing and, um, and a few drag and drop, et cetera. So computer-based, around 450 prices constantly go up uh, and change. And, and you take it where you pay, basically do your driving uh, license, at your, your, your driving test, right? So MS, your Pearson View centers, and you take them at various points in the UK um, close to you. So you've got to think about AKT and ST1, right? Don't leave thinking about AKT till ST2, even though you can't do it till ST2. Read out what you see, super important, very simple, but super important. Every day in whichever job you're going to do, you're going to see random stuff that you've not seen before. You're going to see stuff that you see all the time. Focus on both. Right? If you see hypertension three times, read hypertension solidly. If you see atrial myxoma once, have a quick glance on it at the evening. Like You have to make that judgment as to how deep you go but make sure you read about what you see because 
the more you do, the more passive you're going to pick up. Make sure you look at the curriculum in ST1 because the AKT is based on curriculum. If you don't know what the curriculum is telling you, you need to know, then all of a sudden you're going to come up to AKT prep time and realize, okay, this is too vast. So when you start looking at curriculum in ST1, you start to learn more passively because you're, you're aware of how much there is to know. NICKS, the primary care core guideline in the UK. So remember, NICKS is a, basically a summary guideline of all of the various guidelines out there. So for example, asthma takes into account NICE, takes into account BTS, takes into account all the various um, different guidelines and it comes up with a combined primary care based guideline. So all of our teaching, for example, for AKT is based on NICE CKS because in AKT, that's what I would learn. So start to get used to looking at NICE CKS. All of our flashcards that I showed you earlier, they're all based on NICE CKS. And then social media, like I said, we do a lot of passive learning so we do a lot of teaching without you realizing that you're being taught. And that's really important to start bedding in some of these concepts and guidelines. So I'll talk about those things in a second. Actually, I'll talk about them. Uh, no, it's coming up in a second. So before we do this, let me talk about those two things. There. So the daily email list that I sent you early on, that link, which Pooja might be able to put in again. Um, a lot of you guys use this already, which is great. But every single day, every evening, we send you an email, a quick clinical question, and a quick video with some guideline stuff on there. So basically, even if you do nothing for a whole year, if you use that one email every day and watch that one video every day, you'll have learned 365 really core cool things before you even start thinking about AKT. So get onto that email list, There's a, it's a link, you put your email address in, you sign up, you can leave if you don't like it, it's fine, but try it. Passive learning just gets things ticking in your mind. Secondly, social media, which I'll talk about in a second, we have lots of free social media on passive streams, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, because I know that when you're not on these things to learn, but when you flick through these things, if you see something stand out like a guideline, you just read it and move on, it's passive learning and it starts to embed these things. So when you come around to physically learn it properly, kind of it's already in there. So our, we do a lot of passive learning we'll talk about in a second. AKT, we have loads of resources. When you come to AKT, then we can help you get through it because we focus on two things, knowledge and technique. Both are equally important. Live courses, online courses, audios, mocks, um, cards, gold packages. We have the work. So whenever you come to AKT, think about this. Our gold package is a 12-month program. So if you're starting to think about AKT in ST1, we have our main 12-month program to go with that. And that comes with the, the countdown day-by-day -day guide as well. So if you're someone who's super keen and wants to get involved early, then we've got everything. If you're someone who wants to leave it till two or three months to go, then we've got stuff for you as well. So RCA then, the recorded consultation assessment, used to be CSA, clinical skills assessment, before everyone had to go to basically the, the college and do a 13-case OSCE. Now, because of COVID, that got cancelled, the RCA came in. RCA is basically the same 13 cases, but now you record them with real-life patients either on audio console, video console, face-to-face, -face. you record them, they're sent to the college, and the college mark those recordings. So it's the same principle, 13 cases, that you're marked in the same three domains, data gathering, interpersonal, critical management. If you've just done PLAB2 recently, it's the same three things that you're being marked on. But by the time you guys come around to do this, it'll probably be a hybrid. So the talk is that in 2022, we had the um, we did a conference about six months ago, and we we had the chair of the RCGP on, and we asked them about this, and they said by mid 2022 probably the new assessment will come out, and it's probably going to be a hybrid of RCA and CSA. So probably by the time you guys get to around to doing this in ST3, you'll probably have to do some cases recorded at work, but also go and do some kind of OSCE assessment as well. So that's probably what we're looking at at this point. But again, it starts from ST1. So it comes back to that thinking like a GP. When you're assessing somebody in clinic, in a hospital uh, assessment room, think about GP side, think about ICE, think about how is it impacting them psychosocially, think about their journey so far, think about impact on work, think about impact on home. The, if you start thinking like that in ST1, ST2, when it comes down to doing these assessments, you're already thinking in that zone because it's a different way to think in primary and secondary care. Get lots of consultation feedback because it, it's all based on consultation. So the more consultation feedback you can get, the better, particularly particularly in your in your primary care jobs, ST1, ST2. And then start getting into that holistic management mode. Yeah. So you've got to treat the acute stuff. That's fine. But you've also got to think about, if I was in primary care, I'd be seeing this person six times in the next year. 
what are the kind of things I need to be thinking about on the fourth visit as opposed to the second visit or the sixth visit when I'm about to say, well, you know, you've done great. Let's see if you have any problems. Holistic care, very important to think about. Um, and, but you can only take the exam, of course, in ST3 onwards. So AKT is ST2 onwards. RCA or whatever is coming is going to be ST3 onwards. Number nine, super important. I had no idea how important networking would be. You know, I kind of thought, let's start a GP training, keep my head down, get through everything, pass my exams, come out the other end. Okay, you can do that. But these days, if you don't network throughout your training, you will end your training and think, oh, okay, now what do I do? Like, I don't, who, who do I go to? Where, where do I go for jobs? Um, what's a good area to work? Who can I ask? I don't know. I don't know anybody. Who, what organization can I join? What's the best organization? Which one fits me? See, if you don't network throughout your training, and I get that in training is busy, and I get that in training you've got exams, and I get that in training you've got 100 things to do, don't, don't, don't neglect the importance of networking because it's going to save you and help you not only throughout your training, but also afterwards as well in a huge, huge way. So network, of course, with your peers, and this might sound really obvious, but there are so many trainees who just don't, just don't engage with their peers, just people in their own training scheme. People are doing the same exams. People are going through the same rotations. They go to their, their weekly teaching, but they just don't engage. And okay, some people are, are like that and that's fine. In, that's fine. Some people have their own ways of doing things, but you do miss out. You miss out on sometimes staying sane, just talking to people and realizing that I'm not the only person that's struggling with this. I'm not the only person who's been through this or yes, you're struggling as well, or you don't know what to do with this, this what, what this assessment's all about as well. Just to stay sane and make sure you realize that I'm not the only one Take this out on important dates. You know, ARCB is coming up. Make sure this is done by then. Make sure you've done this assessment by this date. Like, if you don't talk to peers, you, you miss out on these really important things. New ideas, making things easier, making things simpler. You know, I remember doing when I was doing my um, VTS, I used to hate typing all my uh, reflections. And I was just talking to someone, and they're like, why don't you just dictate it? I thought, whoa, okay. And I, I never thought about that. But if I, hadn't, if I hadn't networked with that person, I wouldn't have got that idea. If I would have just sat, sat on my own and did my own thing, I wouldn't know. So just engage okay it's, it's super important it sounds silly but it's super important get on those whatsapp groups it's really it's really good how st1s you know on i see it on our group all the time on facebook you know anyone in ipswich starting gp training let's get a whatsapp group anyone in northampton gp training let's get a whatsapp group just start these things off if you're not in one already start it because put a message out in our group you'll find loads of trainees in the same boat as you who are going to jump in and you start to realize you're not alone you've got stuff for people to talk to and social media of course is a great way to do that Network with educators. Don't just use educators to educate you and do your assessments. Just talk to them about their career path, particularly in GP land. Like, why did they choose this? Why do they work two days a week? Why do they go into cardiology? How do they get into cardiology? Why do they get into education? How did they do it? Like, what was their first steps? You know, success is a path that's been trodden by many people already. And you might as well use the experience to find out how you can create your own career. Don't just keep your educators for just, you know, please pass me and then thank you and I'll see you later. Here's a box of chocolates. Don't like just use their experience, network with them, find out about their things, not just medical, non-medical. You learn a lot about balance. And of course, I'll tell you about jobs and stuff later on as well. If you've made that effort early, you can't just go and randomly ask someone about jobs if you haven't made any impact with them in the last three years. So, so networking is super important and it pays for many, 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 many years to come. And of course, try and go to events, try and go to meetings, less going on at the moment, but they will all open up again. Try and go on courses, network, network, network. We used to run our live AKT courses in Birmingham, Manchester, London, and people used to come and meet each other and they remained in that group for, for ages. They just met at that course. They didn't know each other before. So just try and do this because it makes it, it takes the stress off you and it shows that I'm not the only one in this boat. And, and we talked about social media earlier. These are the ways that people can connect through our social media streams because we have, we're lucky to have quite a big following on social media because we teach so much. Um, but I know these things are very useful to connect with people as well. So, for example, the GP training support group that um, I think we've put a couple of times in the chat. I'm just going to put it once more, guys, just because um, people have asked for that again. Just bear me one second. So there's the GP training support group. I've just put in the chat there. There's our main page as well. Instagram is a big one for us, guys. If you're on Insta and you're not following us, have a look at it. Just get your phone out right now. Just literally just get your phone out. Look at Insta, Dr. And, uh, underscore Ahmed underscore Aurora, and just follow it. If you don't like it, just come off it, but just see how we passively teach you because it's something that we can try and do on a regular basis. Loads of videos on YouTube. Um, teach on Twitter as well, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. But please do try, particularly Facebook, particularly Instagram, particularly YouTube. These three, we do a lot of stuff for GP training, and I want to make sure it helps you. Number 10. 
Number 10, ARCP. I used to fear this um, because I heard lots of horror stories. People didn't pass ARCP. People got called up to ARCP. They had to go and sit in front of this panel and explain things about their portfolio. I used to panic about this initially in ST1 so much, but actually it didn't need to be as worrying as I let it be. And also you can make sure it's not as worrying by doing certain things in the year as well. So ARCP, um, like we said, is done every year, minimum once every 12 months. You might have to do other ones as well if things haven't gone to plan, but minimum once every 12 months. So if you're on a three-year program, ideally, you want three crystal clear, no problem, in and out ARCPs. Basically, there's a panel. So a panel gets together and they assess your portfolio. They'll assess a group of, they'll be given a group of people, of trainees, and they have to go through portfolios and look for evidence. These are not trainees that they're involved with. They're trainees that they know nothing about, but it's a panel that goes through everything. So like you know, a second earlier, all your documentation needs to go on your portfolio because that's the only thing that can be used to help you look at ARCP. So you've got to get it right. So basically they look at all the documentation for the preceding year and they look at your fitness to move into the next year of training. So can you go from ST1 to ST2? Can you go from ST2 to ST3? And then can you come out the other end with an outcome six, which is what we all look for, recommended for CCT. So if all goes to plan, you should be getting outcome one, outcome one, outcome six. Of course, there are other outcomes. Some need you to do more training. Some need you just to do a few more things in the current time frame. But ideally, you want 116 or 1116, depending on what kind of program you're doing right now. A couple of others to remember, but I wouldn't worry too much about them. The main thing is make sure you think about your ARCP well in advance of having to think about your ARCP. So most don't have a problem, but and most don't have to fear it, but you do need to know what you need to get in there before each year. So for example, before your ST1 ARCP, two months before that date, you need to make sure you've done all your minimums, all your mandatory requirements, all your minimum assessments, all your minimum learning log numbers, make sure things are reflective. And you can only do that by going back to the point we talked about earlier, which is planning. If you don't plan early on, you're going to get to ARCP stage and you're going to stress. And you might be lucky and squeeze it all in, you may not. And if you don't, you run the risk of not getting an outcome one and having to do maybe extra time or just going through the stress of being called on ARCP day to come and sit in front of that panel and explain what's going on. So don't fear it, but that only comes from planning. You can't just put your head in the cloud and things will be fine. And do your own pre-ARC beforehand. So before, you know, two, three, before you know that the panel is going to look at your portfolio, go through your own portfolio tick off everything. Ask your PDs if you can have the tick off sheet that they do, they use to go through a, a portfolio and just do it yourself. Just make sure you realize, oh, I haven't done this. I need to do it. You've, but I've got three weeks to do it. So your own pre-RCP is super important so you don't get hit on the real ARCP. It's super, super important. So 10 things that I didn't think about or didn't get told about that I wish I'd thought a bit more before I started my own GP training. Number one, I, I didn't realize how much I'd feel lost but also how okay it is to feel lost, but what I can do about it, ask questions to everybody and any for anything. Who is who? I didn't know the difference between ES and PD and CS. Hopefully you know a little bit now, but you'll pick these things up and just get used to these acronyms. Number three, I forgot I'm a GP trainee. Too many times I forgot I was a GP trainee. I was just stuck in hospitals and I just didn't even think about GP land. And I wish I had done a bit more because I could have picked up so much more, I think. Portfolio overwhelm. I, yes, I was overwhelmed by the portfolio. What would I do differently? I would have I would have dived in. I would have just started doing stuff the minute I got access to it and not waited till a month in and then felt pressurized because everyone else knew what they were doing and I didn't. Importance of planning. I, I got this wrong at the beginning. I got this right in SC2. Plan your week, your month, your rotation, your year. Get everything, big wall calendar if you, can, if you can. Makes a huge difference. Difficult days. I knew, well, put this way, I didn't know there's going to be that many difficult days. And I didn't have a plan for when they happened, but hopefully you guys can following this. Think about it. It is coming. They are coming. Plan for them. Assessment overwhelm. Yes, there are lots of assessments. I got overwhelmed with them because I didn't really look at them, understand them, read the guidance. If you want us to do it, it's in our online courses. If you want to go and look at it all at yourself, look at it yourself, but make sure you don't go in blind. Exams. Yep, I think I got these okay. I think I maybe left it a little bit too late with AKT, but I got on top of it. I had a plan and we want to help you make sure you get through your exams okay. But do start thinking about them for ST1. Don't think I've got ages to AKT. It's going to come very fast and hit you. Networking. Um, I did this okay. I think I, I, I talked to enough people and I, and I found that really helpful for some of these things like the difficult days and the fact when I hadn't planned, networking saved me. So 
Um, whatever you do, network with your peers, with your educators and anyone else that's involved in training. And then don't fear this too much. Don't fear it too much, but don't put your head in the clouds. Make sure you understand it and you do your own pre-ARCP well before your own ARCP actually happens. Congratulations once again. This is going to be a huge part of your career. You're starting on the path that you've chosen. The path is going to be with you probably for the next 30, 40, 50 years. And these are the choices that you're going to have in two, three, four years that can start to kind of make you excited about the next 30, 40 years of my career. You have earned the right by going through all of your assessments, by going through the rat race so far, going through F1, going through F2, going through MSRA, you've earned the right to now start to choose your own career and choose not just the career, the direction of your career as well. And hopefully some of these things seem exciting to you and they're going to get into your mind early on so they can start to plan your next three years. Don't forget the coupons. I think, let me just check if they're not run out. Uh, we have one, two, three left of the gold package. Yeah, three left of the gold package and flashcards. Uh, we have, I think it's two, maybe three. Two or three of those left as well. So they're going to run till midnight unless they run out. But the codes, again, the, the links will be back on, on the, the chat. The Facebook group, please do join. I'd love to connect with you there. Please do join us on the webinars coming forward. Get the handbook. A lot of stuff's covered in the handbook. Please do download it. If you haven't already, please do download it and just keep jumping in and out whenever you can. Thank you so much for your time, your valuable time. We went on a little bit. I apologize, but I hope you don't mind if I did because I had so much I wanted to cover with you today. Hopefully, it was the first webinar of ours. Please let us know, guys, how it was. Was it useful? Was it helpful? Are you going to be back? Am I going to see you again on another evening webinar? Please let me know how it was. Good. Thank you for the kind words. I can see them all coming so far. Thank you for the contribution. Thank you for the questions. I am going to go back and try and get through the questions because there were quite a few. So if you want to stick around for those, please do. But if you need to leave, I know it's a working day. If you need to run off, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for it. But I'm going to go a little bit silent and start to look back through some of the questions right now. But um, any feedback for us is always valid. Let me just make sure I've got all the rest of the links in before I start going through the questions.